Welcome back. We got Tulsi again. Hey. Woo! It's so fun, right? We clap every time. Yeah. We do, we do. Because we, nobody claps for us. Yeah. <laughs> Bart, you and Tulsi knew each other previous to this. Explain. Yeah, what's up? So, uh, Tim, he comes to Vegas every year to do Tim who? Tim Kennedy. Oh, he just says Tim. Look at that. Oh, yeah. First day basis, oh, 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 these guys. Oh, 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 oh. What an asshole, dude. Tim, Tim would be offended if he didn't use his whole yeah, name. Tim Kennedy, one of the coolest people on earth. Um, he truly, truly cares about people. Um, like just one like side personal story. I had like some my own questions of like how I want to plan the next like five ten years of my life and what I want to do, and I knew he would be someone that would be good to like get advice from. So I texted him and he goes, "You know what? Call me in five minutes." And I was like, "Okay." I How'd you guys meet? How did I meet him? Oh, you know what? Remember during COVID? Yes. A bunch of Asians were getting beat up. Yes. So, <laughs> but during COVID, a bunch of Asians were getting beat up, and you have all these like, like super Asian, like liberal pages, yeah. like, oh, what are they doing there, whatever. And they make it like this racial issue. And um, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm a, a very proactive type of person. I'm like, it's actually starts with situational awareness, and you have to be in charge of your own safety. Yeah. And I'm like, who's like, who better than to ask than like people that specialize in this kind of stuff? So I just randomly cold DM'd him. I'm like, hey, I know you teach sheepdog courses. Are you down to do a situational awareness seminar on my IG Live? Um, and he was like, that is literally my mission statement to help people protect others. And he doesn't know who I am or anything like that. And I'm like, the, the fact that someone like lives and dies by their ethos, yeah. I'm like, this guy's fucking sick. Yeah. So we did it. Um, and he explained all these things that like like one two three four five that everyone can do and I'm like you have to really dumb it down too because a lot of the people that are the victims are older and so it has to be something that can be executed by like a 60 year old grandma 70 year old grandpa or whatever so after that we stayed in contact and then whenever like I am in Austin or if he's in Vegas we'll kind of like reach out so that kind of like nice. yeah nurtured the relationship but then uh, yeah he's in shot show every single year. And then so he was doing this veterans workout thing. So he invited me to come. I was like, oh sure, I'll stop by. And then that's when I saw Tulsi there. Like, oh, you were just there already? There I the was workout. there for, uh, it was my first time going to SHOT Show. Okay, cool. And um, Tim Tim was, was nice enough to just uh, say, hey, anything I'm doing, please come and join us. Because he did a bunch of panels that had to do with veteran suicide, post-traumatic stress, uh, a whole bunch of things. Um, yeah, so my husband and I were there for the first time and uh, experienced a full day of SHOT Show, which was very, very busy. Um, and then the, the morning, I think it was the morning we left, we went and uh, did, did a workout uh, led by Tim Kennedy. The funny thing is Bart, uh, message me messages me he goes oh i was checking in you know Tulsi's doing all of her workouts like she's really working out she's not like pretending to work out i'm like did you because she's in politics did you picture her like holding the shovel and pretending to work and getting a photo op yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. People, i've like, seen right. stranger things <laughs> do public things right oh, like yeah, pub yeah, yeah, yeah. so like i'm like okay who like i saw brian calendar i'm like who here yeah. is gonna cheat reps and not really because <laughs> tim's workouts yeah. like are crazy like okay, we're gonna do a yeah. hundred squats then a hundred calories on the salt bike and then this and like they're the, if you're Sport. done and you're not laying on the floor, you exactly. for sure cheated. Wow. Right. Exactly. I'm like looking around, I'm like, oh shoot, everyone's like giving it their all here. Yeah, so I saw a group photo, I saw you in there. Me and, you know, Steve, we're actually Huge massive fans. fans. Huge fans. Right? We always reference, you know, um, the primary debate. That's when I first saw you on the scene, and I, I usually am bored, like, in those debates, but you made it so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but you made it so real, you know? And that was one of the realest, like also with, you know, Andrew Yang and a lot of people talking about real things and none of the- Not the uh, the nonsense, like- Nonsense, circular talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your feelings, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But it was, your yeah. truth, my truth. Oh, yeah. geez. But that that moment I was like, Bert, you have to ask her. He goes, I tried, but she went, she left so fast. <laughs> I, know, I, think I, was, I was like, oh, I'm gonna talk to her in person. And then uh, I think maybe use the bathroom or something. <laughs> He's like, I, like, I can't yeah. find her. She's gone. <laughs> She's gone. And I was like, maybe I'll try messaging her. And just like Tim, you're super cool. Reply back. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's pretty cool. No. You're a cool person. No, thank you. Um, I am having a blast here with you guys. And you wrote a book. Wrote a book. For love of country. Yes. Go get it now. For love of country. Party. Leave the Democrat Party behind. Um, you know. Just before you hit record, we, I was just saying like how awesome it is that you guys 
have come together, done this for so long. Each of you has such a different background from the other, um, and you have fun. Like yeah, there, there's, amazing. there's a, a, this, and it's unfortunate, but so much of what I talk about can be pretty depressing. Yeah. Because there's a lot of shit wrong in the country mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. And and I, I always. I feel like it's always important and necessary to make sure that we remain hopeful uh, and and recognize the power that every one of us wields in our own hands with our voice, with our time, the way we choose to spend our energy and, and the energy that we bring to our conversations uh, and our relationships. Um, Matt and I were talking on the way here how, you know, in life, in front, I'm sure you guys have probably gone through this together, but you know, we, we hope and expect that as you learn new information or you have new experiences, you have the self-awareness enough to think about them and say, oh, well, maybe that thing that I thought was right, it's just been challenged by new information. So maybe I can learn from that or learn from a mistake or learn from an experience. This is essential in life, but somehow when it comes to politics, people are so resistant to that. I've learned a lot. There are different things and different views that I once held that that have changed over time. And and in certain circles, people are like, oh, I don't believe you. I don't trust you. How dare you do this? How dare you change? It's like, well, how, how if, if there's something you really care about, how do you expect to influence and encourage people to, to come to your understanding, which is this position is the right position, unless you're willing to treat people with respect, have that dialogue and say, yes, here, this is, this is why I hold this view. Tell me what you think and let me understand where you're coming from. And maybe you learn something new in the process. And this is, this is truly where, it's what I experienced during the 2020 campaign, not on those debate stages where everything is kind of pre-staged in this political theater, uh, but it was out on the road in these town halls. Sometimes it was one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, just one I'll mention quickly because it was so memorable. I was in this tiny little town in, in rural Iowa. I met with the Democratic chair of that town who was like a 23-year-old kid. Wow. And uh, there were probably 12 Democrats in the town of 300. Oh, wow. It was, it was wow. very, 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 like the whole town was a square that took me 10 minutes to walk around the town square. Wow. A lot of banjo playing. I <laughs> <laughs> different, uh, maybe different part of the country. Uh, do they play banjo in Iowa? I actually don't I know I have that. no idea. I didn't hear it okay. if it was okay. there. But uh, one of the things that I made a point to do during that campaign was to go and talk to the local newspaper, go and talk to local radio, go and actually talk to the, you know, the people who know what's going on in their community. And so I, like I did there, I said, okay, I want to go talk to your local paper. And he's like, okay, cool. Well, he's the local business guy. He's the local lawyer. He's the, the writer, editor, and printer for the local paper. And, uh, and, and so this kid warned me, he's like, I'm just warning you. Uh, he is very, very, very conservative. And he's eager to meet you and he's eager to fight you. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so I knew that going in. I was like, all right, cool. I wanna meet this guy. And so I went into his office and it was what you would expect of a guy who does 10 different things you know, small little office, papers stacked like all the way up around him. And so I went and sat down and we started a conversation. And I could tell his, he was just like, and it was, it was not angry aggressive, but it was certainly, he was looking for kind of the combat debate experience. Um, but I, instead of taking the bait, I asked him, I just started asking him questions. Like, tell me about yourself. Like, what did your dad do? Like, wh wh where'd your family come from? And it turns out he came from a family of farmers. And the issue he wanted to fight me on was climate change. And as I mentioned in, to you earlier, I'm very passionate about protecting our environment. Throughout that entire campaign, I never used the word climate change. And I don't use it now because it's become such an incendiary, triggering yeah. word mm -hmm. that means different things to different people. Yeah. Is the climate changing? Yes. What I care about is conservation. What I care about is clean water. What I care about is protecting our open spaces and that we as people should be custodians of what mother nature provides to us rather than exploiters. Um, and so seeing that that was his line of attack was like, oh, you crazy climate change people, this, 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 and that. I just asked him about his background and I said, well, you know, uh, and I'm summarizing this, but um, 
I said, didn't your dad as a farmer really care a lot about the quality of the soil? Didn't he care about having clean water to be able to irrigate properly and produce good crops every season? He said, well, yeah, I'm really passionate. This is so important. And so by the time we came to the end of the conversation, we were friends and we had found common ground and recognized that even as labels may appear to pit us one against the other, we really cared about the very, very same things, which would this kind of realization and understanding would only have been possible by, will, by both of us being willing to sit down and have a real dialogue uh, without being infected by the, you know, the political hit words that mm, are too yeah. often used to tear us apart. When I watch these debates, the thing that bothers me the most is I can't hear the moderator because you guys keep on talking over them. <laughs> and everyone's talking over each other. Yeah, yeah that's true. Them. Everyone. Yeah. Why, why can't we get more moderator, you think? Um, Stupid. Because they're not running for office. Oh, okay. I'm guessing that's why. But okay, okay. in those debates, and Andrew Yang could tell you the same thing, on average, both he and I got somewhere between six to eight minutes of total talk time in a two hour long debate with 10 people on the stage. Wow, wow. Total, that includes opening and closing statements, which are usually- And you two had the seconds. most interesting things to yes, say yes, that yes. everyone wanted to hear. Yeah. yeah. We made the most of those six to eight minutes. But those clips are what went viral and yeah. all that and everyone else is just boring. Yeah. It's the same talking points. Yeah. What's that like though? Is it like- But that's where you saw that, like I noticed, like that, that happened the first time and you know, Yang complained about it, I complained about mm -hmm. it publicly and and so the moderators, the people hosting the base, are like, well, we're gonna do better next time. We're gonna make sure it's more fair and equitable so one candidate doesn't get 30 minutes and you get six minutes. And so I remember going into the second debate, a little naive, it was like, okay, cool. They got the point, mm. they're gonna write the ship, Taking and, the and it'll be, you know, it'll be fair. And I just remember <laughs> standing there at the freaking podium. And every time the moderator started to ask a question, like physically, I was leaning in. I was like, oh, fuck, this is for me. I'm ready. Let's go. And and was let down and disappointed. Wow. They're like, and Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> and so and so. <laughs> and Kamala Harris. And Joe Biden. I was like, come on, people. Uh, but but that's why we saw, I think the first debate had like 27 million um, viewers that first debate of the, the, the Democratic primary and very, very quickly it dwindled down to single digit millions of people actually tuning in mm -hmm. because they see what you see. They felt what I felt. I was like, all right, this is so predictable. I've heard it all before and, and there's nothing you're saying that actually brings value to me that'll better inform my decision as a voter. It's just like what I remember in the 2012 debate, the Republican debate that I was talking about with Ron Paul. Yeah. He's the only guy saying something different. Everybody else is literally saying the same thing. Yes. Just in a different way. Yes. And I told you, I was I was a Bush guy. I was like a, I don't know, naive little kid, basically. I, I uh, But now I'm more of a Liz Cheney guy. Are you? <laughs> Tell me the difference between the two. Uh, she, she, uh, she's Other a, than she's, she's a female and she's a yeah. female. She's a people. She's a people, that's cool. Okay, she all right. Um, yeah, not much, not much. But yeah. but no, what, do you, what is your take on why you can't just talk to each other? You guys are adults. You can't just stand up there, no moderator, like Lincoln Douglas style. They traveled the whole country on a train and just like debated each other in, in all these cities. Why can't you guys be adult? You're Congress people. You guys like the... The, the echelon, up yeah. echelon. Why can't you just talk to each other? Ask it looks like questions. lawyer games. Right. It doesn't look yeah. like oh, yeah. real yeah. debate tactics. Yeah. No. yeah, yeah. That that's what it should be. It should be, you know. And this is this is the thing is like Joe Rogan should moderate a presidential podcast. That would be yeah. so good. Debate. Just call it a conversation. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Because <laughs> debates are, you know, there's just like, it's it's like attack, counterattack, attack, counterattack. I would love an in-depth conversation where you'll have candidates saying, hey Bart, you know what, I think you're right. I, I really agree with you on that. We should, we should work together to solve that problem. Or just saying, well actually no, I think you're wrong on that and here's why, and here's what I would do differently and why I'm right and you're wrong. The, having 30 second, 60 second answers in a debate, what do you expect more than, than um, I mean I know because I prepared for it, which was like, I know, if you're gonna ask me a question about border security, I've already prepped in advance what I'm gonna say about it. That last 30 seconds, because I've timed myself. Mm, yeah. wow. Or if you ask me about, and, and this was um, 
this was that Kamala Harris exchange. I don't even remember what question Jake Tapper asked me because I didn't care. I knew that in that moment, I needed to take that opportunity to speak and point out her record, uh, atrocious record on criminal justice, mm -hmm. yeah. given she was saying she would be the prosecutor president of the country. But but that's what I was forced to do. Instead of actually answer the question the, the moderators you love were trying to ask, <laughs> I, I couldn't. So I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't waste my one, my yeah. 60 seconds mm -hmm. on answering that question because I wanted to talk about something that I felt was very, very important, but shouldn't be that way. Yeah, right. But and I don't, I just, I don't know. It, there's a lot of money yeah. involved with these debates. The sponsors, it's the relevance of cable news that, that hosts these debates, it's the relevance of their moderators. And you have this, this presidential debate commission that is supposed to be like the neutral arbiter for these debates. We, we, I would not be surprised if we were to sit back down here on November 6th, the day after election day, and talk about how screwed up it was that there were zero presidential debates. Same. Wow. That's a very likely scenario in this election where, you know, even as screwed up as these debate formats are, um, I, I would not be surprised if voters don't have a chance to have these candidates standing side by side on a stage talking about issues or whatever, just talking. But the news keeps telling me how sharp Biden is behind closed doors. <laughs> yeah. They do keep saying that. So it's, he's probably pretty sharp. <laughs> I think what would be cool is people did a tour and they did like Joe Rogan, like Russell Brand, Tucker, Car uh, Tucker Carlson. JK News. JK News. <laughs> News. Just maybe not even debate on their show, but at least just hear like thorough thoughts yes. for an hour or two. Just everybody so we can all vote. But we I, don't have stairs like, in here, Joe, Joe Biden can get in. <laughs> but what I like, I like what stairs. Trump kind of started off for the primaries, and I kind of want to keep this on in both camps, is that should just be a roast fest. So all the politicians come out with the best roast that they have on each other, yeah. right? Because it makes them human and all that. It's it gets fun. viewership. That's it gets great that's viewership. Side, yeah. yeah, dude, that's what puts you on the map, especially with a lot of people who never heard of you. I already knew you because I'm pretty I read a lot. Wow. Um, <laughs> when you took out Kamala Harris, that was like I saw people I never yeah. thought paid attention to politics to talk about you. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was uh, I, I was surprised, and I'm still surprised that as I. You know, I will have random people come up to me and just say, hey, you're the one. Yeah. <laughs> you're the one who took her out. <laughs> <laughs> was there retaliation after she became more powerful and became the vice president? And like, she was like, oh, I remember you in the primaries. Yeah. And then like. Because you ended her campaign. Yeah. That's what everyone says. Well, she did drop out shortly after that. Yeah. yeah. Um. Here, here's the thing that, that most people don't know is that after that exchange, I was told by friends of mine who were in the, the studio in the green rooms for a lot of the media outlets who were there covering um, the debate that there was a collective cheer that went up because a lot of people saw what I saw um, but were too afraid to say anything about it or question her on it or wow. hold her to account for her record. And these aren't people who are fans of mine. Mm. It was kind of this thing, oh gosh, finally, somebody like said the emperor has no clothes on. Um, so to, to answer your question, not that I know of retaliation mm. from, from Kamala Harris specifically, um, but I think part of that can be attributed to the fact that there are a lot of people in the Democratic Party quietly and some loudly who from the day she was announced as the vice president running mate for Biden, were like, this is not a good, this is not going to turn out well. Mm. And, and unfortunately for the country, um, that has been proven to be true mm -hmm. over and over and over again. But where I saw very real retaliation and consequences was from uh, coming out and endorsing Bernie over Hillary Clinton in 2016 specifically because of her atrocious foreign policy record. Mm. Uh, there were, there were, and I was warned about this. They're like, you, you are on the shit list mm. for a very long time. My Democratic, former Democratic colleagues were saying, uh, good, she will be elected president and you will not get a single penny for your district in Hawaii, for anything. Wow. Wow. 
for schools, infrastructure, whatever. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> I, I had a reporter on uh, MSNBC, I think it was shortly after I, I made that announcement. It was at a debate that they had in Miami, I think. Uh, on live television say, well, Tulsi, aren't you afraid of what the Clintons will do to you? And, uh, you know, I said, no, I'm not afraid. And here's why. But uh, I, I went, I mean, the, the consequences of that decision uh, are still being felt today. All right, well, when we come back, we're going to ask Tulsi some of the dumbest questions she's ever been asked in her life. Ooh, here we go. <laughs> we can ask some dumb questions. Marty, we're already sorry. We're already sorry. <laughs> Not our regular.